Hello everyone, my name is uh, Joe D'Angelo, I'm the publisher at Elsevier and Materials Today and I'd like to welcome you to our second Materials Today webinar of 2019 which is titled How Mechanical Properties of Polymers Change with Temperature. Uh, the webinar is going to be presented by Dr. Tobias Flock from NETCH and Professor Tim Oswald from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the US. And this webinar is sponsored by NETCH. Um, so as you know, Materials Today strives to bring you educational presentations on some of the most exciting topics in material science as part of our webinar series. So be sure to visit the webinar page regularly to find out more about upcoming events and recordings of uh, past webinars. So back to today, it's now my pleasure to briefly introduce and welcome today's uh, speakers. So uh, Dr. Uh, Tobias Plock uh, studied physics in, in Beirut and joined Netscher Garatabau in 2011. So up until 2015, he was responsible for application support on dynamic mechanical analysis. And since 2015, he's the manager of the business field Polymer, where he's in charge of strategic marketing for all thermoanalytical methods of the NETCH portfolio related to polymer applications. And professor Tim Oswald is a professor of um, mechanical engineering, and he's the director of the Polymer Engineering Center at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Professor Oswald teaches polymer and polymer composites processing and designing with polymers and polymer composite, uh, composites and, and, um, and, and does research in the same areas. So in particular in the area of um, fiber orientation, fiber density and fiber length distributions. Um, so after that short introduction, let me just quickly remind the audience of the structure of today's events. So the, the presentations will, will begin quite shortly and following the presentations we'll have a, a Q&A session. Um, Please do ask questions during the webinar and after um, uh, and when you think of them uh, by just using the Ask button on your screen. If we don't get to answer all of the questions during the webinar, um, then the presenters will get back to you after the webinar with, with direct answers. Um, so I think, yeah, um, uh, we can now begin. So I'll, I'll hand over to Tobias to, um, to start his presentation. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Uh, welcome also from my side. Um, uh, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. My name is Tobias Flock uh, in behalf of Natural Analyzing and Testing and of our uh, co-host uh, Tim Oswald from Polymer Engineering Center in University of Wisconsin in Madison. I welcome you today's webinar, How Mechanical Properties of Polymers Change with Temperature. I'm very happy that we're on air today with materials today as I think this still is one of the striving topics in, um, uh, let's say, polymer research. At least this is very clearly what I experience uh, in my doing as business field manager of NETCH. Uh, we will talk a lot about, well, this is kind of my, my background about dynamic mechanical analysis, and we will learn how to use this and how this can tell you more about your material as a function of temperature. As you do not have uh, the pictures of us, right? So we don't have our webcams on yet. Um, well, the, the guy on the left, that's me. Uh, just so you have a picture in mind who's, who's uh, presenting. And of course, again, from my side, I, uh, a warm welcome to uh, Tim Oswald, who's in Madison right now. I assume some of you might know uh, Tim as I can say one of the key figures of uh, polymer uh, research right now. I hope every one of you read at least one of his uh, famous books, which you should have done. Um, if not, um, you should uh, think about this now after the talk. Um, and I think he's, a, he's a, a brilliant partner to have today for uh, covering this topic of mechanical properties as a function of temperature and maybe more. And he will tell you more about this later. Two words about the company Netsch. If you're not familiar with Netsch yet, don't worry, I will not go do this uh, in all depth. Um, there's three business units in the NETCH group. I'm from the one that you can see here on the left. I'm from NETCH Analyzing and Testing, where we uh, produce thermal analysis instruments and instruments for the determination of thermal physical properties. Uh, we bring them to the market, we service them. Um, maybe you, you heard about this. If not, uh, that's the right time now. Uh, the second a business unit is grinding and dispersing, where we deal with uh, processing equipment for uh, these tasks. And the largest part of the NETCH group is pumps and systems. If anyone of you is more in a production environment, 
or have seen these natural pumps around, um, that's a special kind of pumps um, we add for viscous media. I'm speaking to you from net analyzing and testing the whole world of thermal analysis. So we do this for over 60 years now. We produce instruments for material analysis, um, especially, of course, also polymers from the business field where I'm talking to you. So some of you might have heard the names differential scanning calorimetry, thermogravimetry, evolved gas analysis, if you want to couple this with spectroscopy, laser flash, for thermal conductivity. If any of these topics ring, ring a bell, um, well, refer to Natch. Um, we are going to concentrate today on a technique called dynamic mechanical analysis, which tells you about mechanics as a function of temperature. I assume all of you, sooner or later, if you're still studying, um, we'll find yourself somewhere in uh, the workflow of polymer processing. So you see there's quite a variety of methods that are applied. Um, I'm not saying that thermal analysis is the only technique to use there. And of course, this is, uh, there's very complementary techniques, but already from concentrating on dynamic mechanical analysis, you see this. Um, this is a very fundamental technique um, to know about the mechanics of your polymer part. And that, of course, also takes its role here. Why are we here today? So I always bring up this slide by uh, Professor Richard Feynman. Well, he's, I think, at least for myself, one of the greatest uh, physicists that have been on the planet. And we're here because at NETCH we do science. And I can say I'm, in, I'm involved in, in material analysis at many points, so I'm not talking about lab management or these things. But in the end, it comes down to doing science right. And this is what Feynman is saying, so I would quote him, science is a way of trying not to fool yourself. The principle is that you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. So if you keep that in mind, I think you're on a good way to do uh, science with the instrument that we have as uh, at NETCH. And I have, uh, one slide that takes us right into the business with um, mechanical properties as a function of temperature. And some of you might know this picture, as this has been voted as one of the most uh, known pictures on Wikipedia some time ago. Um, it's been a while ago already. Nevertheless, you shouldn't forget what happened there. This is the explosion of the Challenger space shuttle just after the start in 1986. Um, and the question is what, what happened there? Of course, if you read through the story, there's a lot of management procedures as well, but eventually it comes down to uh, uh, material properties that were not applied in the right way. And here I come back to um, Professor Feynman, who was leading the Rogers Commission in these days, that reported on the, on the failure. Maybe some of you have even remember the, the, um, the experiment he did in uh, the show on TV, where he uh, was putting this all this all ring in ice water and taking it back out, and it would not uh, deform. And the report states, O-ring resiliency is directly related to its temperature. A warm O-ring that has been compressed will return to its original shape much quicker than will a cold O-ring when compression is relieved. So we have a material property here that is resiliency, and that is significantly related to the temperature. And if you know the story about uh, what happened to the space shuttle, um, it's been that uh, they wanted to start at temperatures below zero, and that's just not such a good idea. If you have an elastomere, um, an elastomere O-ring, um, in your, or is it the liquid oxygen booster rocket on the side and the liquid oxygen boost, uh, the liquid oxygen is dripping out into the, uh, uh, into the uh, flame, this all ignites and the whole thing blew up in the end. So know your, know your uh, material behavior. That's the take home message. And this is what I'm going to talk about uh, today, how DMA, Dynamic mechanical analysis measures mechanical properties as a function of temperature. And I'll start with a phenomenological description. Um, Professor Tim Oswald will later go on, let's say, into this in more depth. 
First, let's look at a textbook definition. Dynamic mechanical analysis provides information about viscoelastic properties, so we're going to learn what that is, of a material under small, mostly sinusoidal load as a function of temperature, yet also as a function of time and or frequency. And I will concentrate on the temperature part, and you will learn later how, from Tim Oswald, how this is related to time and or frequency response. And to give you a hint, maybe that's just uh, that's just uh, the the other side of the metal okay viscoelasticity what is that so how can we understand that well you have a material and you can think of the material being made out of out of something like a, a uh, the model system would be a spring so elasticity means you deform your spring you see in this graph here um, you put a strain on this on the spring it expands so you uh, uh, you elongate it, and as the action of stress is uh, is finished, the uh, spring goes back to its original shape. So that's that's just the one thing of viscoelasticity. However, there is a second thing, and that is called what you can see as uh, this uh, uh, dash part here, um, and it shows a totally different behavior. You apply a strain at uh, point zero at the action of stress here. And it will start to deform, but only gradually. In this case, it's linear deformation. And it, most interestingly, and very different from elasticity, uh, you take away the stress, and it will just stay like this. And eventually, a viscoelastic polymer can be understood of a combination of springs and dashboards. So somehow, these polymer chains behave as spring-like properties as well as dashboard-like properties. And we will learn. Uh, sometimes you learn it in a hard way that um, th uh, there's eventually both, you have to take both properties into account. We do a different experiment. We do this in a dynamic way. So we uh, deform, we have a small sample, and we apply a stress in a sinusoidal curve. So, um, sorry, I went back here. Okay. So the input looks like a sine curve. Um, that is the dashed line you see here in the back. Um, and the material will react by deformation um, by a strain. And there's, it will just have the same frequency. As a, yeah, it can't go at another frequency. It will be a little bit strange. But there's an interesting phenomena. And that is that um, the strain, so the response from the sample is somehow delayed. And this is actually what we see on a viscoelastic sample. Viscoelasticity of a polymer leads to a delayed sample response. And most interestingly, this delay is a property of the material and um, describes, we will see in a second how, describes the viscoelasticity as the magnitude of the viscoelastic response. And this is what we want to measure by dynamic mechanical analysis. So you input the stress, you get the strain, and you form a complex modulus. Modulus, um, in this case, is defined as stress over strain. I won't take you through the whole thing here. Or let's just say a miracle occurs. And now we get to number. And now this becomes a complex number. So you get a, a number E prime. And the complex part, um, the, sorry, the, uh, the real part is E prime, and the imaginary part is E double prime. And that is a quantitative measure for the viscoelasticity. Um, e prime is given like that. The, um, e double prime is given as a sign of um, the delay phase, and people look at the ten at the tangent of the phase factor. And this is, if you calculate it through, this is nothing else but E double prime over E prime. The good news is that, of course, a DMA instrument that you would have calculates this for you. So you have to get this, you have to get these numbers. And the only step we have to do now, we have to understand what this has to do, what E prime has to do with my material and what E double prime has to do. And for that, um, all we have is this, we can look at this, uh, let's say, thought experiment. Um, imagine there's a, a guy standing there dropping a ball on the floor, and you will see that the ball jumps up to a certain height. And the height is proportional to the ability of the material of the ball to store energy. 
So E prime describes nothing else but um, the stored energy, the elastic, reversible, or spring-like response. So that refers to all the springs in my in uh, in my material, and that's why we call it the storage modulus. E prime. Uh, but you see, we don't get up to the full height again, so we are missing some part, and that refers to the loss modulus and to the dissipated energy, viscous, irreversible, or dash pot like response. And now I will now show you what a typical DMA measurement looks like. You see that here. Um, at the x-axis, you can see this is a, a temperature scan, so we turn up the temperature. And we do this from uh, minus 100 up to 100 degrees. And there's a lot of things happening. So if you look at the green curve, this displays the storage modulus as a function of temperature. And you see a large drop here. The loss modulus in blue shows uh, a peak at this transition. And uh, 10 delta is uh, the, the, the tension of the phase, um, shows another peak a little bit at higher temperatures. Storage modulus, loss modulus, and in red, loss factor. And this is nothing else but the glass transition of an elastomer sample. And glass transition is one of the most uh, 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 intriguing things to look at if you're dealing with polymer, because this kind of determines everything. If you if you uh, uh, look at the application range and so on, um, it determines the, the behavior of a rubber. It's responsible why we have winter and summer tires, why we have to buy winter and summer tires all the time. Um, and you can, um, well, if, you, if you're able to adjust the glass transition, you can really adjust the application range of a polymer. Um, how do you know it's an elastomer? You see the glass transition is at temperatures below um, room temperature, below zero degree. So um, at temperatures below the glass transition, you're in a glassy state. Um, then follows a glass transition. And above, you're in a rubbery state where the elastomer behaves like a rubber, like we know. Just to give you a picture, this is what an instrument looks like. This is what the Netsch DMA. Uh, 242E Artemis looks like. Um, and let's have a short look inside um, because that kind of, that's that's interesting and that takes us back to the experiment that we do. We need an oscillator that generates a force signal. Um, this signal is transduced onto a, via a push rod onto the sample. So down here, this, is, this just shows a three-point bending sample holder, but there's several other sampling holders, sample holders like shear or um, tensile and so on. And um, uh, I just told you that this is uh, followed by a displacement of uh, your material. This is the response of your material and we trace this uh, displacement. So we get a force in the displacement and we can calculate E prime and E double prime from that. And of course, um, we need a furnace at the bottom to measure this as a functional temperature. And that's just what we do with this with this uh, furnace below here. Um, I bought one uh, application case because this really shows the significance of this uh, technique, and that's the detection of the glass transition of a polymer. Um, I'm not looking at a simple polymer, but we're looking at a thermoplastic elastomer. Um, so that's certainly not a rheologically simple polymer. I assume Tim would agree to that. Um, it's a rubber that can be melted. So the crosslinks are thermoplast crystallites, and it can be processed like a like a thermoplast. Um, typical question: You apply this, and of course you have to know the glass transition temperature because this determines the application range for this material, uh, whatever you want to make from it. And so I'm showing a typical DSC scan. This is kind of the number one technique that everyone is doing. You see the scan. And, well, you see the melting peak of the crystallites here at around 120 degrees. But the question still remains, um, where is the glass transition? Because obviously, uh, maybe some of you might, might that are experienced a little bit, might know where this is already. But uh, honestly speaking, on the first limbs, the uh, question remains, where is the glass transition temperature? And where is the glass transition and the glass transition temperature? 
So we take your whole sample into a DNA and you just get a very, very different picture from this rather simple looking UC curve. Because we see the whole uh, mechanical response and the glass transition displays most strikingly in the mechanical response, especially in the DNA. In green, you see this large, this rather large drop starting already at about zero degrees to about 100 degrees. Um, in blue and dashed, you see the uh, loss modulus with uh, two peaks here, and the 10 delta is the slotted line in uh, pink I display here. So where's the glass transition? What do you think, if you remember uh, the, the elastomer sample? Well, that's just this large drop of the storage modulus here. And I claimed that already at the beginning, if you want to detect glass transitions, the DNA, dynamic mechanical analysis, is most sensitive to the glass transition. So how did I determine the glass transition temperature? Because this is what you get from your material data sheet. Um, and already that is not so obvious because it's a question of definition. You have to define which of the parameters, E prime, E del prime, or 10 delta, you're looking at. So here I would state, um, you see a glass transition at about uh, in E prime at about minus 15 degrees already. Um, a beta transition at lower temperatures at minus 110. And a, the crystallite melting, of course, as the second step at 139 degrees. And the, 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 the scaling is a little bit different. I put this on uh, logarithmic scaling, but uh, uh, don't be confused by that. Um, in that graph, again, I uh, introduced the DC curve as well. This is just overlaid. And my take home message here is um, if you look at temperature dependent properties of your material, it is worthwhile to use dynamic mechanical analysis because it just shows you the, a very different picture. So if we uh, evaluate the glass transition in the DC, you get this transition at about uh, 58 degrees here. However, the DMA shows you the entire transition region. So we lose, um, we lose stiffness. We, we see the drop in E prime already as much, much, uh, we see it much, much earlier at uh, uh, much lower temperatures. So the take home message is DMA directly shows the mechanical application range. And that should be it so far for uh, my part. And I would uh, now hand over to Professor Tim Oswald to dig a little bit deeper into uh, this temperature dependence and to bring in time dependence of this phenomena as well. And I think this will um, give you uh, some striking insight at some point. Okay, Tim. Um, uh, thank you, Tobias. Slides are yours. Um, so uh, thanks for having me here today. So uh, this is a little picture of my research group, uh, some of my graduate students and postdocs, professor of mechanical engineering, and the one standing right in the middle there, the older guy with all the young people. So uh, Tobias already gave us an excellent uh, introduction of the equipment and of, the, of some of the theory. And so I'll go back a little bit of a review here. And um, if we look and see... Um, this graph, uh, this is a little mental experiment. Uh, so uh, think of uh, having a material which is in the middle that is stretched a certain distance delta x zero uh, in the positive and the negative direction that gives us a strain uh, of uh, eta zero uh, if we know the length of that um, uh, specimen. So let's look at the left picture and so what we do uh, is we are going to introduce then uh, this deformation in a sinusoidal wave. So the strain is that total strain times the sine omega t, uh, which means that the speed or the rate of deformation is just the derivative of that, which is a cosine. Um, uh, so, so then uh, if we have a solid material, if we have a perfect spring, and we put a little uh, uh, transducer to measure the stress, we will see that the stress response, when we put a sinusoidal strain response in, is also a sinusoidal stress response. It reacts directly with uh, the strain. And so the stress is just this in stress of zero times the sine omega t. So if we divide stress by strain, uh, we all do that all the time in engineering, uh, we get modulus. You notice that the sine omega t and the strain and the sine omega t and the stress cancel out. 
So we get a modulus. A modulus is just simply the maximum stress divided by the maximum strain. That's if we have a perfectly elastic material. If we have a perfectly uh, liquid material, a Newtonian fluid, then remember the, the response of a fluid uh, is directly related to the rate at which we, dis at which we deform it. The rate at which we deform it is a cosine curve. And you'll notice that the stress response is really a function of the stress times the cosine omega t. Well, stress cosine omega t uh, could also be seen as a sine uh, wave that is lagging behind 90 degrees. But if we take the stress response, which is cosine, divided by the rate of deformation, which has cosine, the cosines cancel out, and we actually get a viscosity. So if we have a perfect liquid, the stress response is 90 degrees off phase uh, from uh, the strain response. If we have a perfect solid, elastic solid, the stress response is in phase with the deformation. Well, a polymer is neither one of the two. So a polymer uh, falls right in between. And so in our mental experiment now, we, we have two curves in this graph. One of them that starts at zero uh, is a sinusoidal uh, strain input. Uh, and the sinusoidal strain input will give some form of a response in the stress field. So notice that delta T, right under the PN polymer, that's the lagging of the stress response to the strain input uh, in the sinusoidal wave. Well, that delta T times omega leads to an angle delta, which already uh, Tobias has discussed. That angle delta is, is really the lag of the stress response to the strain uh, input. And so now we have... The, the, the stress response here is some sine times omega t plus some delta, and it's going to be really difficult for us to take the ratio of the stress divided by the strain. And so that's what we call the complex modulus, which is what the magic box that Tobias presented, which actually the, the DMA equipment from Netch will actually do all those calculations for you in, in, in this measurement. And so we then uh, can do a little bit of the math, and you can again recognize what Tobias showed you, the portion uh, that is proportional to the cosine uh, delta and the other portion that is proportional to the um, uh, sine delta uh, are related uh, then uh, to an elastic and to uh, uh, a damping modulus or a storage modulus and a loss modulus, which you see on the bottom there. So the sine uh, is related to the to the damping or to, this, to the loss modulus, the cosine is related to the elastic portion or the storage modulus. So it's what you recover when the ball bounces up. Um, uh, e double prime, which is the loss, is what you, lo you lose uh, when the b b ball uh, band bounces up. So we can then also know that if we deform the specimen, you're going to dissipate energy. Why do you need this information? Well, for example, when you're, when you're doing tire design, your tire constantly goes under deformation. Well, there's that deformation, part of it you're going to recover, but the other part is inner friction due to the loss modulus. So we want to know what's the energy dissipation, for example, per cycle. And so we take the stress response and the strain response, we take the product uh, of the stress over the strain, which is the stress times the strain rate, dt, we integrate that to find how much energy is dissipated in one single cycle uh, of, your, of your deformation. You do the math there, you can kind of see you have sine curves, you have cosine uh, uh, curves, uh, and you can then from there calculate. As you do the integral, you get a, a delta E or, a, or an energy that is dissipated that is equal to pi times the total strain squared times the loss modulus. So you need to have the loss modulus to be able to predict what temperature rise is going your tire undergo or whatever rubber or polymer component you have that is being loaded as sinusoidal. So this damping obviously will go into something that's going to go into heat in a tire, and that's something that you want to know. So if we, if we just go back and, and do a little mental experiment and go back to the spring in the dash pod uh, that Tobias uh, uh, presented, um, the spring deforms elastically. Uh, the dash pod deforms viscous in a viscous way. Um, we know that equilibrium is going to tell us that the force in the spring is equal to the force in the dash pod is equal to the force that you apply to that system. The same is with the stresses. So the stress in the elastic component equals the stress in the viscous component equals the total stress. 
That's one thing. The deformation, you know, if the spring deforms and the dash pot deforms, the total deformation is going to be the sum of the two. And so, so you, you then uh, also know that the rate at which the, the, the system deforms is equal to the sum of the rate at which both components deform. So the velocity or the strain rate is equal to the strain rate of the spring plus the strain rate of the dash pot. But now you take those strain rates and look at the two, uh, two equations on the left of the curve, um, uh, the, the sigma e and the sigma eta, and you, and you uh, solve for your epsilon e and your epsilon eta, and you transform that into strain rates, and you get an equation that says that the strain rate equals the sigma dot divided by e plus the stress divided by eta, and you can rewrite that a little bit, and now we have a model. We have a, at least a mental model with this simple with this simple um, example, spring and dash pot. So now we can put in our sinusoidal curve. So we do a dynamic, let's see what dynamic response we have. We put that into those equations and we solve for stress and we get that function that you see there with the two little yellow boxes. The one yellow box on the left is the actual storage modulus of your little mental experiment of your Maxwell model. And the little, little uh, box on the right is, this, is the loss modulus uh, of that uh, Maxwell model. And so now you can see that the, that the, the storage modulus and uh, the loss modulus are really functions of omega. They're functions of the frequency. And so we go to the next slide, and we plot uh, the, 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 the storage modulus uh, on the left and the loss modulus on the right. And then here we have actually plotted in terms of shear. So you can also do the same experiment in shear as you do in elongation. Most of the experiments that we do are done in shear. Well, although you have fixtures and devices in these DMA equipment where you can do them in elongation or we can do them in compression or you can do it combined or you can do them in bending. But let, let's, let, let's take a look at this, at this graph, at the response. So G double prime uh, or the, the, the loss shear modulus is in red, and the storage shear modulus is shown in gray, G prime. So let's go to very low frequencies. At very low frequencies, right on the left-hand side of the curve, um, you are trying to deform uh, the system in a, at a very slow rate, which means that the, that the dash pot actually deforms and doesn't transmit any force to the spring. And there you really only get a viscous response. And as you start speeding it up, very slowly the forces in the dash pot become higher and higher such that you start deforming the spring and very slowly you start also feeling an elastic response. And so G prime keeps rising, G double prime keeps rising until you reach a peak. And at that peak they cross. Above that peak, the frequency is high enough that your elastic response is higher than your viscous response. Basically, what you have done is you have done the same that temperature does. As you, as you uh, uh, increase the frequency, you basically have done a reduction in, 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 in temperature because there is a time-temperature superposition. So, so an increase in frequency is the same as reducing the, te the, the temperature. And as you increase the frequency, eventually the part becomes more solid, eventually reaching the maximum modulus as you're as your loss modulus goes down and eventually disappears and you have a perfect elastic solid. So on the, on the left-hand side of the curve, you have a perfect liquid. On the right-hand side of the curve, you have a perfect solid. And it's just really by managing the frequency instead of managing, uh, of course, the temperature. So let's, let's go and look and see if we plot stress as a function of strain. How does that look? So at very, very low frequencies, uh, we have a perfect circle that is on the, on, the, on the left, which means all the energy that goes into your system is lost. So it's all dissipated. That means it, that's, we call them Lisa curves, or you can also call them hysteresis loops. The perfect circle is a hysteresis loop that is only, uh, there's no elasticity in it. As you start increasing the frequency, and you raise omega equals to 0.1 to 1 to 10. Very slowly, you start adding an elastic component until eventually when you reach a frequency of 1,000 way on the, other, on the right hand side, you have a perfect elastic system with no hysteresis, no loss. This is, of course, for linear viscoelasticity. This is when the deformation is very small and we have a perfect system that can be modeled with a spring and a dash pot. Of course, the real world is not like that. And 
in the, in, in the real world, uh, you would have this kind of deformation. So this, these are DMA responses of two different materials, a TPU foam for, for, for a shoe and an, a, and an EVA foam uh, for another type of uh, a shoe or for another uh, type of uh, athletic shoe. So if you do, you see two, two graphs, uh, one on the left and one on the right. The one on the left is done at one hertz, which is probably something a frequency that you would have when you walk, and the one on the right uh, is at 5 hertz. That's a frequency that you have uh, when you run. And so you can see, for example, the Nike shoe on the, on the right-hand side at 5 hertz uh, shows much larger hysteresis. It shows more damping. So if your knees, for example, are a problem, then you want more damping. But if you're doing a competitive run, you don't want to do have that much damping. You want to get it mostly returned. So you want to have a Lisa Ju curve that looks more like an elastic response, like the red line that is there. So we can basically, through dynamic mechanical analysis, uh, get a feel what the material has and, and, and basically show those curves. And that gives you almost a reflection of what the athlete feels uh, when they are running or walking in the field. And the same, for example, if we take some PVC material, here we have a PVC material, we're showing, and this is similar to the curve that, um, that Tobias showed, so we're showing the elastic portion or the storage modulus as a function of temperature. Yet, we did those experiments at 5, 50, 500, and 5,000 hertz. So what you see there is that at 5 hertz, it's a very uh, low frequency, you have a glass transition temperature of 90 degrees C. But as you increase the, the frequency, your glass transition temperature shifts up. Why? Because your time scale is becoming smaller and smaller, and you need higher and higher temperatures for the material to respond. Again, we have a time temperature superposition a principle there. And that you can see, uh, so you can actually see what, my, you can from there discern also what process temperatures do you, do you need uh, for certain processing speeds, because time scale will affect the temperature that you need for that. And the same can be done if you look at it rheologically. I mean, we did our, our experiment, experiment uh, from, for thinking solids, but you can also do this exactly the same thing thinking uh, 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 fluids. And so here we have a shear experiment. So our mental experiment here is in shear. We have a shear a strain input and a sine curve, which is the second equation. You have a shear a stress um, um, outcome or, or, or response. Uh, the shear rate is shown as the third equation. You can take the, the ratio of the stress divided by the shear rate, and you get a complex viscosity, just like we got a complex modulus. That is magic that is done in, in, your, in your equipment that will transform, transform it to a, vis, vis, uh, to a viscous response, which is eta prime, or, um, or an elastic portion of the viscous response, which is related to G prime. Um, so you can see, uh, uh, and, and then you can do exactly the same analysis. The dissipative term uh, using viscosity is shown on the left uh, in the visit, dis, um, uh, dissipative term uh, uh, using elasticity is shown on the right. But at the end, it's all the same. It's, it, there is a relationship also, of course, between viscosity and modulus. Um, uh, if, if, if you just think a fluid or if you think a solid, you can transform one to the other one. So if you do, for example, here's just an example of Lisa Yu curves um, that um, uh, uh, are done with high-density polyethylene. Uh, you have a small deformation, that's the upper curve. You have a, a small deformation, um, uh, a large deformation, which is the lower curve. Uh, the upper curve is linear viscoelasticity. The lower curve is nonlinear viscoelasticity. And the nonlinear viscoelasticity simply means that your, your stress response is no longer a sinusoidal curve, as you can see there in this. This is a whole other field of nonlinear viscoelasticity, which you can use large deformations, which, of course, the equipment is there to do all those experiments for those of you who are interested in, in, in nonlinear rheology and in nonlinear uh, elastic responses. So let's do one more example here uh, with a thermoplastic. This is polycarbonate, right? So, so you see this is done at one hertz, and you see the two curves. The one curve is the, the, the G prime, which, uh, which are the open dots, 
um, uh, which is the elastic response, and then G double prime or the story or the loss modulus are the are the, the the filled circles. So you can kind of see as you increase the temperature, you see first the drop in modulus in in, in the elastic uh, or in the storage modulus. As you see also a peak in the loss modulus. That's the glass transition temperature for that frequency at 155 degrees. Then eventually the two curves cross. Uh, so after 193 degrees, um, the the material is more viscous than it is elastic. At that point, you process the material. That's the temperature you want to process the material if your time scale is associated to one second. That's your viscoelastic domain. Right between TG and the softening temperature is your entropy elastic domain, and below glass transition temperature is the energy elastic domain. So what happens if you change the frequency? If you change the frequency, something very interesting happens. If you go from 0.1 hertz all the way to 2,000 hertz, you actually raise the softening temperature from 180 degrees to 280 degrees. That means at very, very tiny uh, time scales, so at very high injection speeds, for example, you actually need um, a, a temperature that is much higher because of the smaller time scale. Remember, a small time scale it means a reduction in temperature. So you actually need a higher temperature to be able to achieve the same thing. Glass transition temperature also has a rise, not as dramatic as softening temperature, but it also shows that in that graph. So you can also do the same analysis if you deal with curing materials, materials that cross-link. This is liquid crystalline, uh, sorry, liquid silicon rubber. Uh, so here um, we are raising the temperature of the liquid silicon rubber as it cures, and so you see first the material is more viscous. That's on that's be on on the on the left hand side of that CG or the gel point. Then the two curves cross. That's the gel point. After that, the material is more elastic, and then eventually the material uh, the, the elasticity really increases and eventually just sort of completely vulcanizes. So the rubber is completely vulcanized. You can do in a shear similar. Uh, examples here you have um, you have a, 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 a bunch of curves viscosity as a function of temperature uh, uh, and you do it at different frequencies so the first thing is the frequency actually um, uh, the, you heat it up so the first thing you see a reduction in modulus and that or in viscosity and that's because of the heating and then of course you see a shear thinning effect so at higher frequencies you get a lower viscosity and then finally you get see a rise in the actual um, viscosity, and that's because of vulcanization, because of curing and cross-linking. So you can actually follow a process doing these dynamic uh, uh, tests and understand your process itself. And not only that, you can then take your finished material, your finished silicon rubber, and this is this is shown right here. This is this was for for a material that was needed for, to make a speaker. Uh, so silicon rubber was a membrane in this speaker. Uh, and 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 we did tests here from uh, um, from one to one hundred hertz, and we needed to have a much higher frequencies. We needed to go up to maybe ten thousand hertz. Well, you can use time temperature superposition principle. So we did different tests, and then. Uh, shifted all the curves, so, so we went from 25 degrees all the way to 95 degrees C, and you can see on the left curve that's just the loss, sorry, the storage modulus. And then we take those curves and we um, we we shifted them and we generate a curve, an E prime curve that is um, that is put together a master curve uh, that you can use then to do the full analysis. And so here you can see. Uh, uh, the final curve, so you see the E prime, you see E double prime, which is the green curve, and then you can also see the tangent uh, uh, de delta, which is the red curve. Uh, so you can um, uh, use those for your analysis. Here, what they wanted for the, that speaker was that over that whole range of frequency that you get a relatively constant modulus, elastic portion, and very little damping, and that's what you see here. And I think that brings me to the end of my part of the presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Tim, for, for uh, giving us this insight. And uh, eventually, I, I, this, this obviously changed the title of the talk a little bit, because um, what you just showed is that um, uh, eventually the temperature transition that we're always looking at is a time transition as well. And this can be uh, or, or uh, vice versa. So uh, at the end of this talk, um, thanks for the examples you showed, Tim. I would just like to uh, sum up quickly. Um, to summarize the DMA method and a little bit what we learned today. 
DMA measures uh, the elastic response of your sample. So this is all the little springs inside of your material, as well as the viscous response. And it's actually the only technique with respect to uh, rheology as well um, that can do that. Let's say if you do a, a static measurement, you will never get the viscous, the elastic and the viscous response and the damping of your sample. And eventually Tim showed you uh, quite a variety of sample, uh, quite examples where the damping uh, well, plays a vital role um, if you're dealing with uh, the mechanics of polymers. Second thing, uh, my take on my primary take home message was that DMA directly displays the mechanical properties as a function of temperature. And as most of the applications that we do, like I was talking about tires, everything in, in the automotive industry, all the materials used there, they have to have a they have to cover a certain temperature range. So you have to take this into account. And dynamic mecha mechanical analysis is just a technique to use that. The take home message from uh, Tim's part was um, taking you a step further, um, a little more math, but I think this was uh, very well explained. Uh, temperature transitions are directly related to transitions in the time and frequency domain and vice versa. And eventually you can, um, you have to take both, um, both parameters into account if you um, are dealing with polymer material. So if you are changing um, the uh, frequency response of your, um, of the material you apply, uh, you have to take uh, the, the changing mechanical properties into account. And that accounts to the uh, time temperature superposition principle. There are a lot more things that uh, you could do with uh, dynamic mechanical analysis. I assume some of you uh, know that material development, failure analysis. Uh, of course, you can see many failure effects in these curves as well. Um, you can hook, uh, hook that up to different uh, other um, to humidity generator to look at mechanical, to bring in humidity as um, uh, as a, uh, another parameter that changes your mechanical response. All kinds of materials are tested. We're talking about thermoplastics, rubbers, uh, blends, TPEs, and there's a wide variety of uh, uh, parameters that you can get from dynamic mechanical analysis. We could only touch a few of these in uh, today's webinar. And with that, I think we're about at the end of our webinar. And um, well, I thank you for uh, listening in behalf of Mesh Analyzing and Testing. And of course, again, I thank uh, uh, Tim Oswald for being here with me today. And um, as we're at the end, um, I think, um, well, I encourage you to ask questions again. So uh, just please put them in, um, in the, the, the questions list of uh, today's webinar. So we're happy to answer that. Uh, before that, um, I would have, um, let's say, go back to Tim and ask him um, some questions, or like at least uh, put this a little bit into perspective, what we heard today. Okay, so um, we saw, um, so what I, what I like, maybe, maybe we could still point this out a bit, is um, the practical implications of your slides. I mean, we learned, we learned now um, what kind of shoes you would use for which, um, uh, for which purpose. So if you can go back to slide 40, where this, where this really becomes intriguing. Um, so obviously, um, if, you, if you just add uh, five hertz, you, so you start running a bit, um, the whole picture changes. So the question would just be, which, which, which would be your shoe, Tim, that you would? You would use. Well, I'm, I'm, I actually wear Adidas shoes, uh, so with the <laughs> okay. technology. So, so, and, and maybe I shouldn't because I'm a 60 year old person. I should probably <laughs> use something that damps a little bit more. Yes, I, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about uh, uh, looking into TPU foams again to to protect my my knees a little bit more. But I mean, this is just a very striking picture that that uh, shows the implication. Um, maybe if I can go on. In... Yeah, and if I may add, uh, uh, Tobias, uh, I just sure. came back from the AMOC, the Additive Manufacturing Users Group, and they have this uh, Rydell, which is this company that makes the, the helmets uh, for, for football players. They have this new, new sort of 
foam structure that was 3D printed from the company called Carbon. And the damping in there is very important. And I think doing dynamic analysis in these scaffold yes. uh, structures is of extreme importance because it would give the information of how much damping there is and how much shock is absorbed. And I think the dynamic uh, test is very important for that. I mean, I can, I can just confirm that. We see from, from the responses that we get from, from interest in this technique that this is still something that is, that is uh, increasing a lot. Uh, so um, you've seen that this is somehow not... It's definitely not a coffee machine where you just press a button and uh, things come out. But if you want to know more, you can recapture uh, today's webinar. And I think this this uh, can assist you quite a bit in exploring this technique. Um, there was one more thing that was quite striking, I think, and that was um, there was this picture um, where you were saying that eventually, if I do injection molding, I have to look at, I have, might have to increase mold temperature with respect to uh, the injection speed. So if I go at very high speeds, which means very high frequencies, I have to take the, uh, I'd have to take this into account. Is that right, Tim? Uh, correct, correct. So for example, let's take as an example, if we have um, a, a very thin part, a very thin part, uh, is going to be injected at much, much higher speeds because you don't want the part to solidify as the mold fills. And so you need to then inject it really fast. And at that point, you probably will need a higher temperature because your time scale is much shorter. And the material thinks at the short time scales that it's more solid. And you don't want that. And so you actually then have to raise that processing temperature because the softening temperature, in fact, in this case here, go, changes by 100 degrees Kelvin, which is significant. And that you can also find yeah. out with dynamic testing. So you, um, um, if I'm looking at so many people do um, uh, these simulations, like mold flow simulations, or use uh, the, the Moldex module uh, with that. Um, so if I, uh, my question would be, if I, do, if I want to do this right, I need, I mean, I need these values. Uh, that, that we see here in this graph. Is that right? Correct, correct. And in fact, where the two curves cross, right? So where G prime and G double prime cross, that's the area where um, above that temperatures that you need to use for processing. Below that, the material is considered yeah. a little bit more solid than, than, than above it. So, so, so yeah. that's where you need to be. You need to be above that softening temperature. In this case here, 193 degrees C. Okay, uh, and the last the last thing I wanted to go into was um, the the construction of a master curve because of course this is one of the the uh, most interesting things that that uh, when you deal with DMA, um, all of a sudden um, while you do your experiment in let's say a time scale of uh, let's say one hundred hertz, one hundred hertz or something like that, and all of a sudden you extrapolate this to acoustic frequencies. Um, so, and that's eventually what, what many people want to know about. Um, my question would be, um, from your experience, how, how, um, how long does that hold? So, I mean, many people do these kind of curves. Uh, is there a limitation to which frequency I can extrapolate? Is there a, a, a limitation with respect to materials to look at? Or how would you see that? Uh, no, no, you're not really extrapolating here. Uh, you're actually using a physical effect, the time pen temperature superposition principle, which in fact I didn't mention that, but it has its roots here in Madison, Wisconsin with uh, Professor Ferry, yeah. who I knew yeah. when, until he was in his late 90s when he passed away. He's the one who actually gave us the time temperature superposition principle, um, which really is direct relationship between time and temperature, uh, which helps you in generating, um, in generating these master curves. So you're not really extrapolating. If you want to have even higher frequencies, well, then you need to do even higher temperatures. Okay, but also from, uh, with respect to the materials you're looking at, you would see that. So that's what, like a little bit from my experience. If, if I get these, the stack of curves on the left, and they kind of, I mean, you can tell quite nicely by eye if they, if they fit or how, how, how far that takes you in frequency. So it will be a measure to say uh, what are the limitations of these, these master curves. Yeah, well, I mean, the, uh, obviously the limitation um, is trying to do the measurement at different temperatures, but I think it's something that the equipment can do. So once you have superposed these, these curves, now here you can only justify uh, the range that is shown on the curve in the right. 
uh, so if you want to extrapolate from there, you're going to yeah. have to do different temperatures. Okay, so you might have to go lower in temperature, maybe maybe do cooling or something. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I I understand that, and that's 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 of course what what uh, let's say in my time using the DMA, what I've uh, what I've done uh, many times, and then then eventually uh, dynamic mechanical analysis takes you into as we said into acoustics and into acoustic response as was uh, used here for this uh, speaker. So I think from my side, uh, I think I'm really fine. Um, thanks again for staying with us. Um, still, I encourage you to ask uh, more questions now. We would be happy to get uh, back to you there. Um, in behalf of Natural Analyzing and Testing, um, well, if you want, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, and I would just give back to uh, Joe from Materials Today. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentations, Tobias and Tim, and and uh, and your your, your kind of uh, Q and A session at the end. Um, so that that brings us to the end of today's uh, presentations and webinars. Uh, webinars. So I'd like to thank all of the attendees of today's webinar, and I, I hope you enjoyed the presentations as much as we have. So don't forget as well that there'll be a recording of this webinar that will be available online very shortly. It'll be available at the same link uh, that the, the live recording uh, was at. Um, and, and like we mentioned, uh, any questions that weren't answered during this webinar will be um, uh, directly answered um, after the webinar. So that leaves me with just enough time to say thank you all once again, and have a great day.